Uh, hello, we're uh, advancing along here in this uh, area of development and one of the real interesting uh, areas uh, of, it, of uh, recent exploration has to do with the teenage brain. And so I want to talk a little bit about that today, tell you about some of the research that's being done uh, in this area. Uh, and it has, uh, this work has uh, really important implications uh, for uh, social policies, uh, as we will see. Uh, and um, uh, one of the uh, big take home messages here is that uh, uh, based upon this research that, uh, you know, maybe we want to rethink um, uh, certain aspects of education, for example. Uh, so again, we'll proceed along uh, in this area and, and try to highlight some of the important work. Um, and much of it is recent um, uh, that has been done. Uh, I like to start out by, you know, asking this question, you know, why do most 16 year olds drive like they're missing uh, a part of their brain? Uh, and uh, the answer to that question really is that um, uh, the brain of the teen is not fully developed. Uh, and indeed, um, I'm going to be making the case to you that uh, uh, because of the fact that the brain of the adolescent is not fully developed at this period of time, that uh, uh, this may explain uh, certain uh, behavioral outcomes that you see uh, that are associated with the, with the teenage years. Um, the plastic adolescent brain, you know, I think the message here is that basic neuroscience is really telling us that, um, uh, you know, as recently as about 10 or 10 years ago, you know, we thought that uh, uh, the brains of 13, 14, 15, 16 year olds was uh, uh, that their brains were fully developed, that they were adult like. And it's simply not true uh, based upon the latest research that has been done. So there's some major questions that I think that we take a look at in this area uh, about adolescent behavior. I think that we've always been concerned, scientists have always been concerned in studying the relationship between um, uh, behavior uh, and biological uh, uh, changes that are associated with adolescence. That's something that's always been a big part uh, of the field of psychology. Um, but we're really trying to take a look more carefully now at neural and anatomical changes that are taking place uh, because we believe that they uh, may in fact be responsible for uh, a lot of the profound changes that you see in many teens in terms of emotions and mood and patterns of sleep, uh, for example. Um, and this work really has uh, important implications uh, for social policies. It has important implications for uh, educational policies. And there are things that, that we really need to, to take into consideration and be more aware of. So again, let's review um, uh, a little bit about brain development. Uh, this is what things look like at three weeks of life. Again, you have this forebrain development, uh, midbrain, hindbrain. Uh, take a look at seven weeks now, you're getting even further development of the forebrain, uh, midbrain, hindbrain, now the emergence of the cranial nerves. Uh, and then at 11 weeks of age, you can see the forebrain is getting larger. It's beginning to take on more of a, an appearance the, that we would see in a more fully developed brain. Uh, and indeed, at uh, the time of birth, um, you can see that the brain, uh, you're getting now uh, development of these convolutions of the skull. Uh, of the cerebral cortex, and, and again, it's a beginning to take on the appearance uh, of a more fully developed brain. Uh, if you take a look at brain growth, again, this is a figure that we took a look at earlier, but this is just as a reminder. You know, at birth, uh, the brain is about 350 grams, first year of life about 1,000 grams, in adulthood it's about 1,200 to 1,400 grams. Now, this just shows age and years up to 10 years of age. But one of the things that we know is this, this is continuing to accelerate here uh, in terms of uh, brain growth, uh, especially during the, the adolescent years. 
this researcher that you see here, his name is Jay Geed. Uh, he's at the University of Minnesota Medical School. And he's been one of the um, uh, primary uh, pioneering researchers in this area, uh, in which he has been doing these very uh, detailed MRIs of um, uh, uh, adolescent kids from about 12 years of age to 18, 19 years of age. And one of the things that he finds is that in the prefrontal cortical uh, area uh, of the brain, um, there's a thickening of gray matter. Uh, one thing, one area here, right here that you can see that's a little bit more white. Um, this, this shows that there's very rapid uh, kind of changes that are occurring in this prefrontal cortical area uh, in the adolescent brain. There's also very rapid development that is occurring in terms of the, of the cerebellum. So he was really one of the first ones to show that there's uh, very pronounced changes that are occurring in the prefrontal cortical area. Uh, and a thickening of the gray matter, and something that we didn't really know before uh, uh, in our explorations of the adolescent brain. Here's another researcher, um, uh, Deborah Yergland Todd, who has um, been making really important advances in terms of taking a look at brain activation by way of these uh, neural MRI images. Um, and comparing adolescents with adults in terms of how they actually process um, information. So if you take a look at these uh, pictures that you see here uh, of, um, of faces, and, and again, the expression of these, uh, uh, of emotion uh, in these faces. If you take a look at it in terms of uh, how adults label this and how adolescents label this, you see some very interesting things. Uh, adults typically see fear uh, in these faces. That's what they label these faces as representing uh, fear. When you take a look at adolescents, on the other hand, they typically label these faces as representing anger. So you see how these faces are being interpreted very, very differently. Um, by uh, adults and by adolescents. Um, here's uh, the neural activation that takes place in an adolescent brain uh, and in an, uh, an adult brain when they uh, uh, take a look, uh, uh, for example, at a, at a uh, figure uh, that uh, uh, represents a high level of, um, uh, of emotion. Uh, and uh, what you see is that in the case of the adolescent brain, they are responding more um, in terms of uh, the amygdala of the brain, uh, the emotional part of the brain, than they do um, uh, in terms of their responses in the uh, cortical uh, smart part of the brain, the prefrontal cortical area of the brain. If you take a look at an adult brain, on the other hand, looking at those very same pictures, um, what you see is that in an adult brain, they're more likely to respond a lot more in the smart part of the brain and less so in the more emotional part of the brain. Uh, so indeed, this shows you know, this very interesting pattern of neural activation difference that you see between adolescents uh, and adult subjects. Um, here's another researcher, Mary Karskadden at uh, Brown University Medical School, who has been taking a look at uh, sleep disorders, uh, and in particular, taking a look at teens. Uh, and one of the things that she finds, uh, and we'll take a look at this more carefully when we're exploring um, uh, sleep, but teens don't get as much sleep as um, adults do. Um, they're averaging about 7.5 hours of sleep a night, and they should be getting uh, at least nine hours a night. So Mary Karskadden says, well, they're not filling up their tank uh, at night. Uh, they're, st they're starting the day on empty. Um, and um, furthermore, uh, she believes that this is negatively affecting their mood. It's negatively affecting them in terms of their ability to react uh, and to think. Uh, and her conclusion is that teens should be home sleeping in the morning uh, and they should not be in class. 
uh, this is a very interesting proposal, which is now being played out across the country, uh, not only in our country, but in many other countries. Um, that uh, because of these sleep deficits, um, uh, teens really aren't uh, as prepared uh, as they should be uh, in terms of starting their, their school day. I'll talk about this a little bit more towards the end of this. Um, Take a look at um, this uh, research too by Carlisle Smith. He has confronted teens with some very simple tests of uh, memorization and solving problems. And he uh, takes a look uh, at patterns of sleep uh, in teens and takes a look at those individuals who are getting good sleep versus those who are not and uh, runs them through a series of these cognitive tests in terms of, uh, uh, again, what we call declarative memory and procedural memory. And what he finds is that those teens who are not getting enough sleep, um, uh, they uh, show deficits in terms of memorization, deficits in terms of solving problems. Those teens, on the other hand, who are getting good sleep uh, do 10 to 30 percent better uh, in terms of their performance uh, in memorization and solving problems. So this is a, you know, a very interesting finding and one which is uh, uh, supporting uh, uh, researchers now uh, uh, have, uh, you know, uncovered a, a groundswell of uh, uh, research which supports this claim. Um, that the sleep patterns that we see in adolescents are really damaging them in terms of their ability to think and their ability to solve problems. So uh, when you take a look at that research, that accumulated research um, uh, about what is happening in teens in terms of their inability to, to get enough sleep, uh, there's this movement now to start classes later, uh, to start them at 9 a.m. instead of 7.30 a.m. in the morning. And this woman uh, that you see here, this scientist, uh, Kyla Wallstrom, has been on the front lines of making these very important recommendations. And it's very controversial because clearly there can be very uh, positive outcomes uh, from this, but also negative outcomes in terms of families and how the whole day gets, uh, gets organized. Uh, and those are things that I want you to think about. Uh, indeed, those are things that uh, I think that's one of those thought questions that I have for you that I want you to be thinking about and coming up with some, with some ideas about positives and negatives. Uh, so again, um, this is an important area is the teenage brain. Uh, and it's something that uh, is relatively recent. Uh, and a lot of that was um, prompted by the research of, of neuroscientists. Who have begin to who have started to take a look at the brain, the developing brain, and done so in a more critical, detailed um, manner. Uh, so that brings us to the close of this uh, lecture, and um, our next lecture will be in the area of vision, uh, in which there's some fascinating research that has been done by uh, behavioral neuroscientists.